This webinar focuses on attendance and on our inspection of attendance. I'm Sue Morris King, Senior HMI, and I was pleased to be able to talk about the research that we carried out into how schools secure good attendance and tackle persistent absence, and how we inspect attendance under the EIF. I hope that you enjoy the webinar and find it useful. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to have you with us for what is our last spring term webinar. And the theme uh, this afternoon is securing good attendance and tackling persistent absence. If you've never met me before or heard me speak on one of our webinars, my name is Lee Austin. I'm one of His Majesty's inspectors. And I'm also the acting national director for education. I'm not alone this evening. We have a, a top team of Her Majesty's, His Majesty's inspectors to share with you the, the messages. And if we just move to the next slide, you can see who we all are. There we are. Um, so as I said, I've introduced myself. We also have Jonathan Key, who's um, Acting Deputy Director for Schools and Early Education. We have Sue Morris King, who again Hi. is an HMI from um, the West Midlands. And we have Claire Jones, who's a specialist advisor in the policy, quality and training team. So, as I said, thank you for joining us um, this afternoon. I know time is precious, not least when we're getting very close to the end of term. So we do value the time that you've that you've given to us. And indeed, the theme of um, attendance and how we tackle persistent absence was one that was shared with us by you and your colleagues from previous webinars. So we are always interested in hearing what themes you might want us to cover next. As I said, this is the last in the series for the spring term, but we are busy considering what the themes need to be for next term. So whether you get in contact with us through the um, mechanism you can see on the slide, or you will indeed receive um, a feedback form after the session tonight. And there is a section on there for you to give us your comments and obviously propose what you think topics of interest might be for next term. And we will consider all of those and obviously get a program out to you as soon as possible after the Easter break. And of course you can use our regular um, forms of communication to get in contact. And from time to time, we have relevant blogs and press releases and actually research publications that I know Sue will be um, sharing with you in just a, just a few moments, particularly the one relevant to tonight's topic. But before I hand over to Sue, just to say, we know we always have lots of interest in our webinar. I think there was over a thousand people interested in, in joining us this evening. <clears throat> and you know that is that is a really you know important um, thing to to stress that we put these webinars on because we want you to hear directly from us, and we want them to be free, and we want them to be at a time that everybody or as many people as possible can can access them. So um, rather than using precious kind of funds and school funds to invite others in to speak, you know we rather you hear from us about us. And therefore, we've engaged with you in this way tonight, and we'll continue to engage in this way and through all of the mechanisms on the screen um, in, in the future. So the last thing I just want to say is you will see us all again at the end of the presentation for the Q&A when we put our cameras back on. But we are going to turn them off for now so you can concentrate on the slides and the messages. And I'm going to hand you all over to Sue, who's going to start us off with some of the research that I was alluding to earlier. So thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, really good to be talking to you today, and thank you very much for coming along and listening. We've had, um, we've had lots of questions in from you in advance, which is great, um, and I've tried to weave some of those into what I'm going to talk to you about. For example, people have asked about what works in terms of working with parents, about persistent absence, governors and attendants, analysis of attendance information. I'll touch on all of those things and of course you can read more in the research report afterwards if you haven't already read it. You might want to look at it after the webinar if you want to. On to the next slide, thank you. So the first part here is our findings from our research that we carried out about attendance. And a bit of background to this so that you so that you know where it came from. This was a, a briefing that was requested by the then Secretary of State at the end of 2021. 
to find out what was happening in terms of attendance in schools and very much about good practice. And we then published this in February 2022 and it was what we might call a rapid turnaround piece. So we did the research um, pretty quickly and got the publication out. And the focus was very much on good practice in promoting attendance and minimising persistent absence. And that's why we've picked this up to talk about again today. There was some COVID related focus because that was, um, and of course still is, part of the context. But the research was mainly more general around what works in schools. And in terms of what we did, you can see some of that on the screen in terms of our evidence base. There was lots of discussion with leaders. That's really important to say, the focus groups with primary and secondary leaders, as well as analysis of our inspection evidence and discussions with HMI. So the findings for this report are based firmly on what the sector is doing well, what you are doing well in schools and what really works. And if there's any leaders who took part in the research with us, if any of you are listening today, then thank you once again for your excellent and really thoughtful inputs throughout, because that was so, so important. Next slide. So we published the report um, in February 2022, and you might well have read it already, but what does it look like? Well, it's a short report with a one page overview giving the main messages and then it's got three main sections uh, we talk in the report about the challenges that schools were facing in autumn 2021 and i'm sure you remember those very well indeed um, and then we go on to talk about securing good attendance and what really works and tackling persistent absence and it's largely focused on effective practice, but also includes the challenges, both COVID related and more generally that schools face in terms of getting really good attendance. What we found was that schools that improve attendance from a, a low baseline or main, maintain high levels of attendance and really minimize persistent absence, all have different starting points and all take slightly different approaches. However, these approaches do tend to have a number of features in common and they can best be summarised as listen, understand, empathise and support, but do not tolerate. That's what came out from the leaders that we spoke to in terms of their, um, their philosophy, really, in terms of tackling and addressing low attendance. It was also clear, both from the inspection evidence and what we heard from school leaders and HMI, that schools that do this really well see the process of securing good attendance for all pupils as an ongoing process, never something that's finished. Next slide. So at the time that we did this research, we found that schools were continuing to face challenges in tackling absence that were indirectly related to the pandemic like pupils and parents' anxieties, or pupils thinking that they'd prefer to work at home as they've done during the pandemic. And we know, of course, that some of that continues now in terms of the challenges that you're facing in school. But what we found was throughout that schools that usually tackled absence well were continuing to do so in that context. And what was really interesting was that for the most part, leaders were using the same strategies that they usually did, showing the same tenacity, conveying the same high expectations. But then at the same time, they were asking themselves what, if anything, they needed to do differently to remove barriers to pupils attendance, you know, some of which were new, as we know, and then systematically unpicking those, systematically acting to do just that. Again, this was the same thing that they usually did, taking this analytical approach. But sometimes at this point, the answers to those questions about removing barriers were slightly different. So what did we work, find worked in schools to secure good attendance in general? Now, lots of people who sent in questions for the webinar are specifically about parents and what worked. And there's quite a lot in the report about that because it came out so strongly from the leaders that we spoke to and from our inspection evidence. And communication with parents about the importance of attendance is crucial. For this to work effectively, leaders and other staff need to have built positive working relationships with parents so parents trust them. 
because these attendance conversations can be difficult, can't they? And at the same time, the relationships need to be built on honesty so that parents accept those tough messages about attendance when they need to. We heard from school leaders about the importance of things like overt messaging, as people said, straight talking, spelling it out. And we see the effectiveness of this kind of approach time and time again in our inspections. We found that leaders who do this well also challenge parents' misconceptions about what good attendance looks like. So percentages can be misunderstood, for example, you know, as one school leader pointed out, 90% in a test might be considered to be really good, but it's not what they wanted in terms of pupils' attendance. That's one day a fortnight off, basically. And, and those leaders said to us that they realised that maybe the letters they've been sending home with the child's attendance figure on, but maybe not fully explained, were being misinterpreted by parents. And so when they'd done that analysis, they changed their approach to this. Often leaders exemplify what attendance percentages really mean as well in terms of learning that the pupil will miss out on. You know, how many phonics sessions does that mean? Or GCSE science lessons, how many of those will be missed? For example, making those links between attendance and achievement really clear. Now, we know working with families um, to improve attendance really needs tenacity because it can be seen by families as a, as a personal attack. Yet the leaders who've taken their schools through this process of raising expectations, often from a very low baseline in terms of the, the ones in our study, um, described a point where the culture really changes and the emphasis shifts to concentrating on celebrating good attendance and being able to celebrate those improvements in attendance and those improvements in achievement that come alongside that. One of the things that we found and we commented on in, in the research is that communicating with parents without paying equal attention to communicating with pupils isn't so likely to be successful in securing good attendance at school. And I think that's particularly the case when we're talking about secondary schools where older pupils are more able to vote with their feet. We heard that from secondary leaders, came through really strongly in our discussions and our in, in our inspection evidence. Leaders also emphasise the importance of the leadership team having a, a positive presence in school, setting the tone, communicating high expectations. Many leaders talk to us about the importance of having the right start to the day that sort of positive and welcoming start as pupils arrived, being a really important part of getting pupils into school um, in the morning and getting pupils wanting to come to school. And some leaders set great store by helping the pupils to understand why attendance at school is important. Uh, one secondary leader noted that pupils won't necessarily make the link between attendance and achievement and future plans. It's not obvious, is it, when you're a young person? And in this particular school, they went out of their way to make those links really overt. So I've talked about communication. And this communication, uh, it's a two-way process. And it's, re it's clear that leaders who have succeeded in, in raising attendance levels listen to parents properly and ask the right questions in, in order to find out why their children are not attending well enough. Uh, one leader described this, and this was quite striking at the time in the conversations, as remembering that there are families behind those attendance figures. Quite a striking quote, really, because we often talk about figures, don't we? And this leader was really clear to point out that this, this is about people, actually. Uh, there are so many reasons, aren't there, why a, a pupil might not be attending school. And we, we list those, we go into those in a bit more detail in the report. So the point there was that it's crucial not to make any assumptions. And leaders really emphasised to us the importance of identifying what they called the right people to have those conversations with parents about attendance, including when issues start to emerge. And what we heard from leaders and what we hear a lot in inspection, actually, is this is sometimes not a senior member of staff who, who can seem a bit more threatening to parents. 
Sometimes it can be somebody else on the staff. The concept of a constant person, though, to work with a family once attendance issues become more serious was mentioned a number of times by leaders. And this person, like I've said, might not be a, a, even a teaching member of staff. Um, leaders talk to us a lot, actually, about the valuable skills and knowledge brought to this role um, by staff who've come, for example, from social work, police perhaps, mentoring backgrounds or other backgrounds that are not necessarily to do with education and the power that can be in that in terms of forming those relationships with parents. Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about recording and analysing attendance because we know all schools record pupils' attendance but not all schools use this information well to target their actions. So that systematic analysis of attendance information is really important. Where leaders systematically analyse attendance information, they can notice patterns. So, for example, as one leader said, you suddenly realise that they've missed the past four Mondays. And it's particularly important in secondary schools where pupils don't spend the whole time with one class teacher and patterns can be easily missed. But it is important in all schools and absence patterns, of course, can be as simple as the pupil missing a week because they're ill and attending the, well the rest of the time. Or they can be a lot more complex. When they're less easily explained, it's that close analysis that allows leaders to ask the right questions. So is that absence each Monday related to what happens at home at the weekend, for example? Is it because the pupil has a lesson they really don't like on that day? Is weekend use of social media a factor? And as one leader put it to us, acting swiftly when things start to slide is crucial and can prevent attendance issues for individuals becoming much more embedded. And that does include, as another put it, noticing those odd days off and doing something about it. Those days off that don't appear to be showing anything in particular don't appear to have a pattern, but could be pointing to something that's really quite important. And where schools do this well, of course, they consider attendance issues alongside other factors, such as what bullying or behaviour records show. What we've found is that many schools that are successful in securing high levels of attendance adopt a similar approach to attendance as they do with safeguarding. In other words, they make it everyone's business all the time. In schools with high expectations for attendance, a high level of attendance for all pupils is part of the school's overall ambition. And of course, we talk about ambition a lot, don't we, as part of the EIF. And that ambition includes that ambition for that high level of attendance for all pupils. So in our research, those leaders who'd improved attendance, we found that they'd seldom focused on attendance in isolation. Leaders emphasise the importance of making school a safe place where pupils really want to be, with the right ethos, with the curriculum that's worth studying and with lessons that are worth attending, making sure that pupils feel that learning is worthwhile and important. The curriculum and the overall provision for pupils with SEND, really important, so that these pupils, too many of whom we know often have poor attendance, have a positive experience in school. And many leaders in schools that do this really well have also worked on behaviour in lessons and anti-bullying measures and the wider school culture as part of their work on attendance, making sure that schools are a place where pupils really want to be. Now, governance was something that came up in the questions that we had in advance of the webinar and how well those responsible for governance consider attendance practices and challenge attendance figures is really important and it also varies really widely from one school to the next. It's not uncommon, for, for example, for governors to look only at the overall attendance figure for a school and then consider where that sits in relation to national averages. But of course, that figure can disguise really big variations in the attendance of groups and sometimes real issues. So getting beneath that figure is really important and governors need to have that information to enable them to do that. 
Some leaders who've improved attendance in their schools spoke about how they've worked with their governing body to, to change mindsets as well and to raise expectations. Some had, had to move, help governors to move away from what one leader described as a, well, what can you expect here kind of attitude to, to one of high expectations and challenge in terms of attendance. Next slide. So what about persistent absence? What we found was, and what we see on inspection, is that schools that tackle persistent absence successfully tend to have all the basics in place to promote good attendance generally. And then they're really analytical about what it is that's stopping individuals from attending. Particularly where persistent absence appears to be intransigent. As we know, there's often really complex factors at play. These factors um, can be related to family circumstances and often they involve some of the most vulnerable pupils. And the most effective schools go out of their way to make sure that they notice the pupils who are often not there and really persist with them. One leader, when we were doing the research, described this as hard to reach families, a term that we often hear, um, people often use, hard to reach families become reconceptualized as too easy to ignore and therefore the ones that need that. And, and in that school when those leaders talked to us in reconceptualizing they'd actually managed to to change the way in which they worked with those families to really good effect. Another thing, primary and secondary school leaders working together can be really powerful in finding out why issues are arising when pupils from the same family have poor attendance. Passing on key information when pupils move from one school to the next is important too when attendance is an issue. Leaders in the receiving school need to know, for example, what the issue was, what were the patterns, what solutions had worked already in the feeder school and what had failed. The attention that some schools give to detail and the lengths they go in order to analyze these barriers is really striking. Many schools um, in the research and many that we see through inspection had examples of how they'd successfully adapted approaches for individuals, leading to huge improvements in attendance. Schools that work well with persistently absent pupils also recognize the small improvements that pupils make. And this is really, really important because it's so powerful. For example, if a pupil who is seldom in school is not there on Monday, but is present on Tuesday, or arrives but is late, staff praise the success. But at the same time, they convey what needs to happen yet next. Expectations aren't lowered, but they're broken down so that the pupil and, and often their family as well can make it seem more achievable. Also, when pupils come back to school after absence, particularly if they've been away for a long time, it's important that this return is really carefully managed. Without this, that they'll go back into lessons where they will feel and where they will be very behind in their learning. The, the right support being put in place, including that support to really help the pupil to catch up where practical can make or break that return to school. You know, if you've been away from school for a long time and the first thing that somebody conveys to you is that frustration that you've missed so much work and tells you how hard it's going to be to catch up, that makes it very difficult for that pupil to stay motivated and want to stay there and want to stay present. And of course, it's really important to acknowledge, isn't it, that the issues that lead to deeply ingrained patterns of persistent absence are often much wider than the school alone can deal with. Working with other professionals and agencies such as social care, local authority attendance officers, virtual school head teachers, then becomes really crucial. Next slide. So alongside the good practice aspect of this work, we did some analysis um, of schools where, where we'd found some significant weaknesses in their practice. These are the, some of the things that we found and they are perhaps not surprising because they're actually the opposite of a lot of what I've already said. So what we found where some of the practice was much weaker 
was that there was often inaccurate recording of attendance, sometimes including inaccurate coding of absence. And of course, the implication of that is that if attendance isn't being recorded properly, actually, when we start to talk about analysis, the school doesn't have um, a hope really of getting underneath the patterns because you won't be able to see those patterns if the recording in the first place is not accurate. So even sometimes where we saw accurate recording of attendance and of absence and accurate coding, we saw a lack of analysis. And if there isn't an analysis, therefore it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to actually see patterns. Sometimes in that case, there is this, this over-reliance on a, we know all our pupils as individuals. Now, of course, in smaller schools and in some bigger schools, you very much do know pupils as individuals. But attendance and absence can be difficult to spot in terms of patterns. So that systematic analysis is really, really important. And sometimes in schools where the practice was weaker, there wasn't any analysis at all. So actually nobody knew about when pupils were absent, why they were absent, were they absent on particular days, were they absent when they had particular lessons, was it related to bullying, was it related to anxiety, was it related to something else entirely. We also saw sometimes a lack of a coherent strategy and this can be where people are actually working really hard and lots of different people are doing lots of different things that they think might work. But actually nobody is stopping to reflect and tie all that together to say what, what of all these different things we're doing, what is working, what is not, what do we need to do differently and actually why are we using this particular strategy what is its rationale and what do we hope to achieve from it? Next slide. We also have seen, and we, we do see this on inspection, where, we, where um, there is some weaker practice, part-time timetables, usually related to send or to behaviour, not well planned, not tracked, not time limited. And I'll say a little bit more about that later when I talk about inspection. Sometimes, uh, and we saw this in the research, we saw it post-COVID, and we see it generally sometimes, is a lack of urgency about when to intervene or when to challenge. And this comes back to expectations and to ambition, which I've talked about already. So, for example, we saw schools where there was no contact with parents about attendance concerns, until attend low 90%, so no alerting parents to the school being concerned before then and about wanting to improve that attendance. So sometimes those thresholds being too low and action not being taken until patterns start to become quite ingrained. You might remember I said earlier about one leader talking about catching pupils before they fall, stopping that drift before it happens. And then I've touched on this just now, but when we've got a slightly scattergun approach to attendance strategies, we saw through the research and we see through inspection, sometimes individual staff working really, really hard to try to improve people's attendance, but with negligible impact, sometimes because of the factors that we've got, um, that we've talked about above and we've talked about already. So I'm going to go on now to talking uh, a little bit about how we inspect attendance, something that lots of people asked about and obviously um, something that's logical to sit next to the research. And a number of you asked us about the extent to which we consider the impact of COVID on attendance. And I think this, this extract from the handbook is really clear about this. It's about the context in which your school is now operating. And also, of course, what went before. And that will be really different from one school to the next. We know that schools were very differently affected by the pandemic. We know that different things happened post-pandemic. And we know that the impact on attendance 
and some of those things that continue to affect attendance, such as parents' anxiety, pupils' anxiety, perhaps some of those ingrained thoughts that children and young people have about, I liked working at home, you said it was okay then, why are you now saying it's not okay? So those things will vary very much from school to school. So what we will want to know about is what you have done and what you are doing to secure the best possible rates of attendance for individuals and groups. And a lot of this goes back, doesn't it, to what I've said already from the research about getting underneath what, what is there, what lies beneath, being analytical, unpicking those patterns, unpicking those reasons. So when you're being inspected, tell us, explain, give us the evidence. And inspectors will listen and they'll use that as a starting point for their questions about attendance. Some of you have asked us um, what we look for in terms of attendance data or attendance information. And the extract from the handbook above gives you some of that answer, as does the previous slide. But if you look at this slide, you might well be thinking, well, you know, what rates, how long, what different groups? We have published attendance data, obviously, um, but as you know, that can never be fully up to date. So inspectors are likely to ask you for um, current figures for this academic year, for example. What's that telling you? And then again, we come back to analysis. What lies beneath? So, you know, 93% attendance, for example, in many ways doesn't tell us very much because 93% attendance could tell us that pretty much everybody is attending for 93% of the time. But it could also tell us that actually the vast majority of pupils in the school are attending for 100% of the time. But then there's a small group whose attendance is very low indeed, maybe around 30% or some pupils might not be there at all. So what lies beneath that figure is really important and it's it's something it's something that you should expect to have a conversation with inspectors about and that's down to you knowing your school your different groups and being able to tell us about the different actions that you're taking for everybody and then for those different pupils and individuals all the way through to those who are severely and persistently absent are there any groups in your school that attend less well than others? And what actions are you taking to address this? How well is it working? Now, you know, sometimes you take actions, you'll be taking actions to improve attendance, very well thought through actions, and they might not be working. And you'll be analysing why that is and what do we do next. So tell us about that. What about any um, individual? whose attendance is really low what actions are you taking what are the impact of those actions and again some of those actions however hard you're working at it might not be working so what are those next steps how are you altering how are you being agile about what you're doing to change your actions these are the kind of conversations you should expect to have about attendance and I think Lee touched upon this in his introduction. This is very much about what you do day by day, not about producing anything specifically for Ofsted. You know, people have asked us what, what should we produce for inspection in terms of attendance data. It isn't about producing it for inspection. It's about showing us how you analyse your attendance on a day by day basis. And of course, as you'd expect, inspectors will also evaluate the ways in which leaders take account of of pupils' low attendance in their safeguarding systems. And that's also linked to that clarity of their attendance recording. So I touched upon pupils with SEND earlier. We know, and it's been the case for a long, long time, that many pupils with SEND do have low attendance. And it's something that schools are, are constantly working on. And you might well have pupils in your school whose attendance is really, really low. Um, what we're interested in is what you're doing to improve this situation. It might be pupils with SEND, and as it says in the, the title there, it might be other pupils who have specific needs. And this includes all the kind of things we've talked about already in the previous section. So you might have somebody, for example, whose attendance has improved 
from 30% to 40%. And in during an inspection, you might want to use that pupil as an illustration of the impact of your strategies. By that, I don't mean write a case study specially, you don't need to do that, but you can have that pupil in mind and you can come to talk to us about this is what we've tried, these are the reasons for um, non-attendance, this is how we've got underneath it, these are the strategies we've used, this is where we're up to, we've tried this and it didn't work, now we're trying this, this has had an impact. So being able to talk to us about some of those specific pupils is really important because it's part of what we're judging in terms of um, that part of the grade descriptor and also of course in terms of, of the school's leadership. And of course, you know, post-COVID, uh, it was the case before, but more so now, some of these pupils might well include those who have got anxiety-related issues, and the same applies. Tell us what you're doing, tell us how well it's working. If it's not working, tell us what you're thinking is about where you're going next. Next slide. So, um, a word on part-time timetables. In our most recent annual report, we commented we said there's anecdotal evidence that part-time timetables are being used more regularly in schools. This is where children attend school, but their attendance is limited to a handful of lessons. This might be held up as an alternative to exclusion, but it's another avenue, we said in the annual report, by which children can slowly slide out of education. Now, of course, DfE guidance is clear that part-time timetables should not be used to deal with behavioural difficulties. The guidance is overt about that now. If part-time timetables are in place to support pupils with medical needs, guidance is clear that they should be carefully thought through, regularly reviewed and time limited, really important. Um, the DfE has published new guidance, um, I'm sure you're aware, in February on mental health issues and where they're affecting attendance. And that guidance talks about where part-time timetables may be used and how. But this guidance has the same parameters around considering reasonable adjustments in school first, having a time limit by which the pupil is expected to attend full time, I mean, that might, be, that might be an ambition rather than expectation, but you would want to see that in there. And having formal arrangements in place for uh, regularly reviewing the timetable with parents and with the, their, um, with the pupil, sorry, and with their parents and their carers. So if you do have any part-time timetables in place, those are the kind of things that um, inspectors are going to want to ask you about going to want to know about during the inspection. So what's the reason for, for using them? When did they start? How are you building back up to full time? Um, and where? what is your thinking around that? We had some questions in about attendance in people referral units and in alternative provision academies, quite understandably, because of course, a lot of the pupils in those settings that come to join you in those settings are those who have had very low attendance um, prior to coming to that alternative um, provision setting. And when you're talking to inspectors about pupils' attendance there, very often, I think this is a really good illustration in these settings of where that big picture figure of your attendance seldom tells that story, does it? So you might have attendance, um, for example, in your setting that is around 80%, it might be 90%, it might be lower than that. It could be anything actually, but the question is what lies beneath? So the kind of things that we will ask you about, as it says at the bottom of the slide, we'll evaluate the impact of the strategies that you're using. And here, perhaps more than in any other setting, that story of starting points and what you've done to improve attendance, what strategies are in place, become really crucial. Because some of your pupils may come to you not having been in school for many months, sometimes longer than that. We know that sometimes they may come to you having been out of school for a year or more. 
So you're building up sometimes from a very low baseline. So the question is, what are the strat what was the baseline? What are the strategies that you're using? What is working? What is not working? How, again, are you being really analytical and really agile and looking at all those other elements that wrap around that child and young person in terms of their attendance, which might be about mental health issues. It might be about um, the curriculum. It might be about the peer group that they're with. And we know that um, alternative provision settings often have to work very hard in that regard. So it's about those individuals and how that works. How is that attendance being built up over time? How ambitious is this and how well is it working? And we'll take your official records as that starting point. Obviously, we will ask about what lies beneath. Note that point about evalu evaluating attendance as a percentage of a full time timetable. You might have some part time arrangements in place, building pupils up. Um, a bit by bit if they've been out of school for a long time, but we'll be, we'll be counting that attendance as part of a full-time timetable. So just be prepared to talk to us, tell us that story and show us the evidence. And in terms of the grade descriptors, these are, these are two extracts from um, behaviour and attitudes, the grade descriptors for good, for behaviour um, and attitudes. And as you can see on here, and this is a really important point, I think, um, that there's clear recognition in the grade descriptors that some pupils with particular needs might have really low attendance. But we look to see that the school is taking that appropriate, swift and effective action. And this part of the grade descriptor, that second bullet on the slide, doesn't just relate to specialist provision. That's not just about special schools or pupil referral units. That's about all schools, because in many, many of your schools, there will be pupils who have particular needs, and some of those needs are around attendance. So we come back to that demonstration of that improvement and actually if you haven't got that improvement that you are taking that swift and effective action for those individuals and you can see as well can't you from this bullet many settings um, some settings such as PRUES and alternative provision free schools alternative provision academies some SEMH schools you might be receiving many or even most of your pupils with previously low attendance and those pupils have particular needs around attendance. And that second bullet then becomes particularly important. And it makes sure that this part of the judgment is fair, it works in all settings, um, and it is equitable. So we've come to the end of the input. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and now we'll take some questions. So over to Jonathan and Claire to take us through some of the questions. Thanks, Sue. We're just popping our cameras back on, everybody. I think Claire's going to marshal us and take us through uh, through a, a few questions now. But I think, Sue, you've, you've, you seem to have done a brilliant job of, of checking in on those as we've gone through. So huge thanks. Right, Claire, what, what have we got to start us off in these last few minutes? Sure. So um, we had a number of questions come in before the webinar started. So thank you very much for people that submitted those. And Sue um, done a really good job there of weaving a lot of the answers to those questions into what you've just presented. And um, one of the things that we haven't really talked about today, and, and I know there's very good reason for it, but Jonathan, I'm just going to ask you to some, give us some detail really around it. So we did have a number of questions come in prior to the webinar around attendance coding, the use of fines, and legislation surrounding attendance. So could you just talk us through a bit of information around that in terms of, of our role as Ofsted and, and inspection? Yeah, thanks, Claire. I spotted some of those in the chat bar as well. Just in relation to coding, everyone, um, really the simplest way for you to answer any questions about coding is to use the DfE guidance. So you can simply Google that. It come up very easy. It's working together to improve school attendance and it takes you through all the codes that, that should be used 
uh, through schools that we can do our analysis. So that's about coding. And that second one in terms of, uh, of fines and legislation, we are often asked that one. Just to reassure you all that, that that's not something that Ofsted deals with centrally. That's a question that we'd, we'd urge you to take back to your schools or the trust that you know uh, support your schools or indeed local authorities, and they'll be able to <coughs> answer any questions in relation to kind of fines as well. I hope that's helpful, Claire. Lovely, thank you, Jonathan. Um, just picking up then on another question that's come through in the chat in terms of what we look at on inspections. So we've we've talked a lot about attendance and looking at percentages and, and whether that's an improving trend for individuals and for, for schools as, as a whole. How do we consider the attendance of children that are non-statutory school age on inspection? So those children in reception and nursery, do we look at that? So over to you again, please, Sue. I think one of the really important things to say there is what we know from this research, from other research, from inspection evidence is establishing those positive patterns of attendance from the start is absolutely crucial in terms of getting children and families into good habits from the start. So that's the kind of thing that we will be talking to schools about. How do they establish those good patterns, um, that understanding of the importance of attendance from the very first day? Whatever the attendance expectation is, are those pupils actually attending and are parents being worked with, if not? I don't know if Jonathan wants to add to that at all. No, no, it sounds good to me. Exactly that, really. And actually, sixth form as well, Claire. The same, you know, the same thing. If we're go, if we're talking about post statutory, that that some of that is as as we know about get, making sure that young people have those habits and are prepared for the next stages, and actually being there, being in school, being in lessons when they need to be, and establishing those good study habits will set them in good stead for the next stage, whether that's college, university, training, apprenticeships, or whatever, those expectations really important. Lovely, thank you. I think, think we've got time for, for just perhaps a, another question or, or two. So, um, I've got, we've got a question in the chat around we, we speak with pupils on inspection and and you know we're very open about the fact that we do that will we deliberately speak with pupils who perhaps have had poor attendance how how would we manage that do we talk to pupils about attendance on inspection as part of, of those pupil discussions I, I mean attendance is something that we might talk to pupils about at any point really in terms of how does the school help you to attend what kind of things does the school tell you about attendance you might come up explicitly in that way i think in terms of um pupils with very low attendance that's something that we would approach sensitively and with school leaders because it might well be that we are talking to you know we talk to pupils who have experience sanctions for example um, to find out how the school has helped them they might be some of the same pupils who have low attendance as well not always sometimes it might be that the school um, that we talk to pupils with send and some of those pupils might have low attendance and we'd always be guided by the school so what we what we wouldn't want to be doing is putting any pupil with low attendance and um, who's very anxious about being in school on the spot around their attendance. So there's something that I think might come up in discussions. It might be around a pupil that we're talking to. And I think as school leaders, we would want leaders to guide us in terms of the extent to which we are about attendance. Would you agree, Jonathan? I think that's perfect. I know it's exactly what I've said. I mean, we'd first and foremost, do anything like that sensitively. But yeah. as Sue said, we'd be led by leaders. So if anybody is mm. thinking all kind of, you know, goodness, what might people be asked? Those, those, aren't, those questions about analysis, mm. now we improve attendance, aren't for pupils. They're, they're, they're for leaders. And as, as we've said, we'll be led by leaders in terms of any pupils we talk to. That's super. I think that then probably brings us to the to the end of the questions in terms of picking picking out the main themes that have come through. So, Jonathan, I'll, I'll hand over to you. That sounds good, Claire. I mean, I was just looking back at the the notes for the whole thing, and Sue and I spoke about this in the week. I think the most powerful message, colleagues, from all of this is making attendance as much as possible everyone's business is really kind of the golden key. It's the thing that that if everybody's alert to, it, it, it will improve. And it's because everybody then attends to the importance of kind of being at school as much as possible. Uh, we wanna thank you for joining this series of webinars over the spring term. Uh, if it's not your first, th thank you so much for coming back. 
and we will be listening carefully to any thoughts that you've got for our focus really as we go into the summer term as well so do let us know if there are things that you want us to focus on in the next round of webinars it just leaves uh, me to say thank you very much to Sue and Claire and, and colleagues. Uh, most of all, thank you to you and for what you do in schools uh, as you support pupils and all your communities day to day. We're very grateful for what you do. So when the break comes, we hope you make the very most of it and it's restful as possible. Do take care and thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.